So I am so excited to have a brilliant, amazing guest that I've been wanting to have on the show since I first started it. It is um, a pleasure to have Shabir Hussein, who is the founder of Gas Station One on One. Uh, 101. Sorry, I can't really. So excited. I can't talk today. Uh, so um, I'm just so impressed by the level of detail that you go into in your gas station blog and your podcast. And you bring your MBA background too um, in terms of how you run your business and how you help your clients run your businesses. And you know, you're also a proud Bangladeshi American. So really glad to have um, you know, feature you and have you, you know, share your story. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I just wanted to mention the site name is gasstationbusiness101.com. Perfect. Great. So thank you for picking up my Slack because I think sometimes it's like all over the place. Well, you interview a lot of people every day. So uh, I just thought I would mention that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So perfect. Thank you so much for picking up my Slack. So let's get started because you have a very interesting story. So can you tell us um, what was it like growing up for you? Well, you, if you're talking about uh, here in in United States, uh, we all go through that cultural shock when we first come here. And I came here when I was really 18 years old, and mm. and coming to the South was really a shock. And shock, I mean, not a bad way, uh, mm. but shock in a way where I didn't hardly understand anything people were saying, and they didn't understand anything I said. <laughs> So the funniest part was everything I wanted to tell somebody, I would first think about that in Bengali, which is mm-hmm. my language. And then I would translate that in my mind. And then I would say it, but the way it would come out, nobody would understand that. Mm-hmm. So it was a pretty <laughs> huge shock of uh, communication where I couldn't understand them. They didn't understand me. Mm. This is interesting because it almost reminds me of... Um, Aziz Ansari's parents who came from, um, I'm, I'm not sure where they came, somewhere in South Asia, but they went into South Carolina as well. So I'm just curious, what made you decide to go to um, the South of all the places in the U.S.? Well, it's because of school. And oh, okay. at that time, uh, the university that I went to, which is the University of South Alabama, was one mm-hmm. of the very reasonably priced as far as tuition and fees were concerned. Mm-hmm. So we picked this school so we could afford it. So this is very interesting because you also went on to get an MBA and you are definitely, you know, somebody who's an experienced business owner. So can you tell us, like, how did you decide to get into the gas station business? Uh, The funniest story was, uh, or it's now it looking back, it was, it's funny, but at that time it wasn't. Uh, I couldn't find a job after I graduated. Uh, I just could not find a job. I went through, uh, I sent out about 300 resumes to different Mm. uh, companies. Nobody would hire me. Nobody would even call me for an interview. And then I started going to these job fairs and only two companies that were interested in hiring me. One was Taco Bell and another one was McDonald's. (laughs) And I I thought about it uh, long and hard. And I realized that this is not why I went to school for. So, mm. so I said, what else can I do? And again, the barrier to entry into gas stations are relatively very easy. Mm-hmm. And I figured, uh, why not try this route? And, mm-hmm. and I would say that's why maybe I got into it. Mm. That's really interesting. And um, you know, as somebody who runs gas stations and somebody who teaches other people, what were some of the surprises when you first got into the business? Well, uh, surprise was that it is one of the most simplest form of business. I mean, if you look at any countries, I mean, you know, this is the mom and pop shop that we all see everywhere in mm-hmm. every country. It's not different in this country. Uh, it's just more electronic based or a little bit more sophisticated. But other than that, uh, that was what shocked me at first, that this is really simple, but at the same token, uh, barrier to entry is very low, but that's the reason people get into it. But once they get into it, they don't realize that there are some hidden, uh, I would say, uh, agendas that can shock somebody because 
one thing, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I should get into it, but I will say in a brief way that uh, when you go to a business broker and they show you that this business is making this much money or that much money, they're not always true. And a lot of people mm. fail to understand, even with business degrees uh, or, or uh, you know, with an MBA even, uh, mm. you know, they fail in through that uh, system where they say, oh, this one makes really good money and I need to get into it. Once they get into it, they don't see any money. So that is one of the shock that I, I saw or I felt uh, when I first started my own business, that this is the simplest type of business, but it can be a very tricky one. Hmm. This is very fascinating to me because you break down in such detail all the things that um, I don't even consider, but um, definitely read uh, your blog because it's very fascinating. Um, and I just want to ask, so for people who are you know, listening to this podcast, they might have some interest in starting. So you've had so many years of experience starting um, you know, this business. What are some of the common mistakes do you see people make when they first begin their gas station business? Well, uh, like I said, the first one is uh, the due diligence part. You know, uh, most of the businesses are sold through business brokers or real estate agents, and they're very good at uh, manipulating numbers. Uh, and when I say manipulating numbers, they don't make out fake numbers, but they can manipulate numbers, you know. And that way, a business that is losing money every month can show quite a bit of profit. And, and mm. that is one of the things that I try to teach everybody that be careful. I mean, do your due diligence. And I lay out a process how they don't have to hire anybody. They don't have to hire an accountant or a CPA or anybody else. They can do it themselves. They just need to look for the things that will give them the real picture as to if this business is making money or not. Mm, that's and I believe that is the biggest mistake people always make uh, when they get into it and they like, we're not making any money. Mm. Yeah, that's one of the things that, you know, people don't even think about. I think it's, uh, like you said, barrier to entry is low, but there are a lot of things you have to be aware of. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, so I'm just curious, like, you know, now you kind of coach other people and you also own your own stations. What does a day in your life uh, look like? Uh, well, my life has become uh, much simpler and, and easier than what it used to be when I awesome. owned uh, <laughs> several stores uh, where I would you know, it's a time consuming business. If you are really involved in it, uh, then every day there are so many things can go wrong. There are so many issues can come up uh, that once you start dealing with them and if you're personally involved in your business, it can take up a lot of your time and, and it can give you a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. But lately I've changed the model. I'm not in the business as much as I'm helping others in the business what I do mostly consulting and other type of businesses. And I still have some stake at a uh, few of the gas stations, but I'm not involved uh, day to day as much as I was used to be for many years. And, and this is how I like my life, where I have a little bit more freedom. I can travel and do other things. That's awesome. I love the fact that you said um, in the business rather than on the business, because right. that's how we get free, right? And you also Excellent. have published books on Amazon and you have a podcast and you do all the consulting. So um, what, um, how, how did you decide to expand uh, to that level? And are you the first person to teach on gas station businesses? You know, I, <laughs> that one thing is a good question. I I'm not sure if anybody else has. Uh, <laughs> I have looked through, but I didn't find anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm guessing uh, that the, I'm the only one, or maybe there are others that I just don't know about. You do a really good job on marketing, though. So can you tell us, like, what are the books that you've uh, published? Well, I published, there are two books. One is a, the first book that I wrote back in 2012 about uh, how to start, run and grow a gas station business. And that was because I used to get uh, people that asked me from different places that I've known people and they know somebody else and they would call and ask, say, how do I do this? How do I get into it? You know, how do I know which one is good, which one is bad? So mm -hmm. I wrote that book. It, it didn't do very well at first. But I figured, you know, I wasn't trying to make money out of that book. I just wanted to write uh, mm. and, and, and be, have that book out there. And, and that's what I did. And later on, I think I published a smaller version of that book. 
And then, as you know, I, uh, as you mentioned, I'm sorry, uh, that I started getting interested about the immigration part of uh, the investment immigration, uh, where people get the EB-5 or the E-2 or the L-1. And I met uh, somebody who was a paralegal for an immigra uh, immigration attorney, and she helped me put that book together where we published it together. So, uh, and again, uh, none of the books that I have are, you know, uh, selling with any record numbers. Uh, but I just thought, you know, uh, it would be a good thing for me to write something. Yeah, and I think that's probably how I found out about you. Like, um, you know, Amazon is always trusted. You know, when I see an author, immediately we, we say, wow, this person, you know, put in the effort and did the work. And I'm really glad that you did it because, you know, I, I've written books before as well. They didn't sell too much, but it, it's, a, <laughs> it's like an authority boost, right? You know, people see, people have a special respect for authors, right? So, and you've done so much work just in your blog and just the free content that you have that, um, I'm sure your book is even more amazing. And I'm glad you brought up the investor immigrant um, option because, uh, you know, immigration is crazy. You know, at the time of this recording, all the policies are changing. But, you know, there is an option for people who want to invest half a million to a million and produce, you know, 10 U.S. jobs to be able to get a green card. So can right. you share with us more on, like, why you think a gas station is, like, a really good investment um, for immigrant investors? Well, um there, there may be, and I'm sure there are plenty of other good yeah, investments. Yes, yes, there are uh, others too. Yes, yeah, not the uh, only one. Yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, the reason I uh, uh, propose gas station, because that's the thing I know. And, and as I said, the barrier to entry and the expertise that you need to run this business is not much. Anybody with some common sense and a uh, and little bit of math skill, uh, can run this business, you know, unlike there are other businesses that you have to have some technical knowledge or some mm -hmm. specialized knowledge. Gas station, as I said, it's the mom and pop shop, the corner store that, you know, whichever country we grew up in, mm -hmm. it usually has one of those next to your house somewhere. So it's relatively easy to run as long as you use common sense approach. And this business still makes decent money. And, and so a family can survive and prosper and grow at the same time. Awesome. I love that. It's just, you know, simple, but profitable. Um, and my next question is, you know, I'm, I'm sure you coach a lot of people in different uh, levels of their business. And you've probably seen people who succeeded versus people who kind of were floundering just a little bit. Um, what do you think separates the gas station business owners who are really successful versus the people who were not so successful? Well, one thing I will say, I deal with two different types of people now. One is the individual type, the family type that wants to get into a station. And they're not sure if, uh, let's say they go to a broker and they find, and the broker gives them a list of three or four stations. There are times they would bring it to me and say, help us pick one. And, um, okay. and if we pick one for them and if they get involved uh, properly. When I say properly means, you know, they're not just hired few managers or staff and say, go run it. That's when you're getting into the trouble of losing money. And because see, not every business handles this much cash as gas stations do. So when you're letting somebody else handle that, uh, and you don't really know how trustworthy they are, or if you don't have a good system in place where you can track your money, uh, then it's very easy to lose a business that is making money. Uh, and But still, you would lose money if you just let it run by other people and you're not involved, you're not tracking, you're not doing your part of the job. Uh, and the other type of people that I deal with, they're the investor type that come in as a group of four or five. They all are successful in their own field. They just want to make investment and they want to people in place and, and system in place where they would track it. And those are the people that do very well with this business because they use common sense and they implement a lot of this new technology that can, you can implement and that can track everything down to a penny, how the money is going, where the money is going and, and whatnot. So as long as they can stay involved some way or other, uh, uh, they will be successful. 
Wow. This is a very interesting point, tracking, because, yeah, like you said, if they keep track of everything um, and are hands-on in the beginning, that makes sense that they would be successful. So I'm just curious. So, you know, now that you're out of the business, but for the people listening, maybe they want to get into it themselves and they do want to have an idea of like a day-to-day, and I know there's no probably like, you know, everyone's business is different, but could you give kind of like a timeline of like an average gas station owner, what do they spend their time doing? Well, at first, I advise everybody, uh, depending on, I mean, not uh, based on how rich you are or how poor you are. I want everybody to get involved in the gas station business at first, starting as a cashier. Mm. You need to clean your own parking lot, you need to stock your own cooler, and you need to run the register and do everything a cashier does in a store. That way, you learn everything from the beginning. And once you're comfortable, you know exactly how the business is running, then you can hire a manager or somebody else and say, you run it and I'll supervise you. As we spoke earlier, that it's not working in the business, but on the business. So, but for, for you to work on the business, you have to really know how the system works, you know, how mm-hmm. To change prices, how to price the product, how to market the product, and all of that. Once you know that, then you can sit back and relax. But typically, a gas station owner, a successful one, would go to their station, let's say six or seven in the morning, make sure all the vendors are being paid, all the vendors are bringing in the right product, all the employees are getting paid, there are no other issues. Uh, of any type of uh, maintenance or others, uh, you know, in gas station, you always run into issues with your dispensers, your, because there are so many electrical components that something can go wrong. Mm -hmm. So just making sure the operation is running smoothly. And once you have enough trusted, good people in your store, you can come home at lunchtime and, and be off for the rest of the day. Oh, wow. That sounds pretty amazing considering, you know, most gas stations are 24 seven, but that makes sense. You know, if you set up everything correctly, um, you can, you know, reap the rewards. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. This is so fascinating. So for those of us more interested in the numbers, like, could you give an average estimate of like a, like a averagely profitable um, gas station, how much could they make um, in a month? Well, uh, I always advise people that uh, there are stations that people bring me, bring it to me and say, look at this and see if, how much money this one makes. And what I usually do is find the numbers that I need to find out. Then I create a projected P&L. And anytime that P&L shows anything less than $5,000 a month, I advise mm. the buyers not to buy it. Because mm. if you're investing money you know, and investing yourself into a business, you should be able to make more than what you can make in a, you know, average job. Yeah. yeah. So because you're taking on a lot of responsibility, a lot of headache and and a lot of other things. So anything less than 5,000, I don't advise people to buy because to me, those are very marginal stores. Uh, But a typical gas station that is average uh, can make around 10 grand a month, about 10,000. That's awesome. That's great to know just because, you know, I think a lot of the listeners are kind of considering, okay, how much money can it make? And I think you probably save them a lot of heartache just by saying the $5,000 figure. So thank you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's. Go ahead, please. Sorry, let me recalibrate. Okay. Um, Great. So let's talk a little bit about um, gas prices, you know, because it's something that seems uh, at least from my end quite volatile. So I'm just curious, how do you negotiate Um, the prices with the vendors? Is that something that you go more into in your book or do you have something to, you know, advise for our listeners? Well, I discuss this in length in my podcast. I believe there are at least two episodes on fuel prices. Awesome. But one thing I will say on this is there is not much room to negotiate when it comes to fuel prices. Hmm. Like you can negotiate uh, how much uh, you pay for a carton of Marlboro cigarettes or a uh, cookies, you know, Mm -hmm. Oreo cookies, you can negotiate. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to fuel prices, because they are published prices, there are Mm -hmm. something called rack prices that are being published from New York Stock Exchange. And the supplier that you get from, they usually give you that price, plus they would charge you freight and Mm -hmm. uh, a percentage for their profit. So it is pretty standard for every gas station to pay similar prices in the same area. 
it's it's very seldom that you would see that one gas station is paying a dollar for a gallon and the next door station oh, is true. paying dollar twenty a gallon. That's not the case here. Yeah, this is so fascinating because I think in your blogs you also wrote that you know most of the revenue comes from the um, the convenience store. You know, right? So, right. and can you sh- sh- share with us your podcast name so we can check it out as well? Uh, it is a gas station business 101 podcast. So it's the same name as my blog. Awesome. So it's really well branded. So that's awesome. <laughs> Great. Yeah. You're just giving so much amazing information and kind of um, kind of giving us a behind the scenes look, right? Because I think we all deal with gas station uh, cashiers and owners uh, probably once every uh, month at least, you know, right. and you're kind of right. giving like a behind the scenes, which I think is very fascinating. Thank um, you. Yes. And so for those of us thinking of investing, um, what is like an, uh, like, I guess, entry level price, if they're thinking of investing in a station, um, how much should they consider uh, setting aside cash wise? Okay. Uh, on that note, I would say again, uh, I address this in my uh, podcast a couple of times where people do ask me, how much money do I need? And mm. What I usually tell people that, let's say, just to give you an example, if you're in California or if you're in New York and places like that, uh, you have to spend quite a bit of money to get into a station. But if you move towards uh, more uh, rural uh, states, like, let's say, Alabama, Tennessee, Mississippi, where uh, the population is not as saturated, you can still find stations that are relatively reasonably priced or you can even find stations that are just for lease you don't have to pay any blue sky money you just buy their inventory and get in uh yeah those opportunities are still out there but not in big cities like chicago new york or los angeles Uh, so there are opportunities out there as long as you're you're willing to relocate and and find the business so uh to give a dollar figure on that, I would say if there is no blue sky money, means there is no goodwill, uh, then to lease a store and buy their merchandise and inventory at cost, you can get into one for about forty to fifty thousand dollars. Wow, that's actually a steal. I mean, considering just you know all the equipment and the management and everything, that's right. amazing. Uh, wow. But again, you're not owning the business. I mean, you're owning the business, but you're not owning the equipment or the real estate, you're just leasing it. And uh, I will say this, even in a rural area, they will not, nobody will give you a business that's making, let's say $10,000 a month Mm -hmm. for free. Yeah, Uh, yeah. (laughs) So you will get something that will make five, 6,000 a month, as long as you're working really hard behind the counter at first and improving the business. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And, um, you know, for somebody who works with a lot of clients, I'm just curious, like, what types of people own uh, gas stations? Or maybe better question is like, what types of people come to you for coaching? Um, Lately, what I've noticed, as I told you that uh, there are two types of people that I deal with lately, one is a family that has some jobs, and they're not satisfied with their job, or they lost their job, and they have a little bit of money saved up. And they are looking into businesses and they land on gas idea of gas stations and they contact me. And the other type are the professional type that uh, is very successful, but they get together, let's say three of them or four of them, and they create a group uh, and they say, let's go invest and buy five gas stations or some of them even buy motels or chain hotels and, and things like that. But I don't deal with hotels. I only deal with gas stations. So there are investors that come and say, we're looking to buy a package deal of four stations and we found a deal. Can you take a look and see if this is a good one? So those are the two types of people that I deal with mostly nowadays. Awesome. Thanks for the detailed answer. And I kind of, let's drill down just a little bit. I'm just curious, how many of them are immigrants and how many of them are Americans? Um, because I think the stereotype is that immigrants start gas station businesses, right? Exactly. Is it, is it true? It is true. And, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> as you know, that there is a joke that if it's a gas station, most likely it's run by an immigrant, right? Yeah. Uh, and chances are, you know, that is true. And the way, uh, if I have to uh, think about the people that contact me, I would say about 80% of the people that contact me are immigrants. Awesome. And about 20% are uh, just uh, U.S. 
based people. And those 20%, most of those 20% are usually families that are looking to get into a gas station, mm. not the investor type. They just want to survive and, and make a good living. And, and that's why they're looking into gas stations. That's fascinating. 80% is actually really high. I mean, not, it is not, high. yeah, nothing against Americans because I've been an American for like 13 years, but I'm still like an immigrant for longer. But um, it's interesting just to hear from you uh, what the demographic is. So, wow, this is, this, then it's a right show, you know, <laughs> uh, but, but seriously, I do think it's a very fascinating business. And the fact that you're helping so many people succeed is awesome. So can you share with us, um, if you can, um, due to like legal reasons or NDAs, um, can you share with us some of the success stories or your favorite clients that you've been able to help? Uh, I shared one story uh, and I shared the P&Ls and all the numbers mm -hmm. uh, step by step. About a year ago, a client uh, came and uh, wanted to buy a package of two stores and showed me uh, the numbers. And then, uh, you know, we started the process where I started asking for different numbers. And one of the stores, uh, which the investor didn't want to buy, uh, mm -hmm. showed a loss. And even uh, the projected P&L that I did, it was showing about a $3,000 loss every oh, month. Wow. But what I did is I started looking through the store more carefully and I realized that's been a severely mismanaged store. So, I advised them to buy the store and they were very shocked. They're oh. saying that this store is losing money and telling us to buy it. I said, this store will double the sale. And when I say double, we usually say that a store can improve by 20%, 25%. But I told them, I said, this store will pretty much double the sales. Yeah. And they took the risk based on my advice and they were rewarded very handsomely. And I shared that story in my podcast where the sales didn't exactly double, but it went about 80, 85% uh, uh, growth. Uh, Still, wow, that's amazing. And, and, uh, and they're making really good money out of that store and they're very happy and they're the one looking into two more packages right now and we're talking about that. But yeah, that is one of the story I tell uh, a lot of people that not always what you see is what it is. I mean, there are, there are times you see a bad store and it is really a bad store. And there are times you see a bad store. It's because there are some issues that needs to be resolved. Mm -hmm. This is really cool. I'm going to, I might look back at your podcast because I listened to a few episodes, but that sounds like an amazing success story for sure. Uh, and you change your lives. So this is, this is amazing. Um, I guess my next question is, um, I think probably only you could answer like, what are your thoughts on like the, future of gas stations, you know, because we see, you know, different electrical cars, you know, we see that there might be self-driving cars. And I think you might have talked about it as well on your blog. Uh, what are your thoughts on the future of gas stations? You know, that is the most email I receive lately <laughs> is, because, is on that subject that uh, what is the future of gas stations? Mm -hmm. And again, uh, I may not be the expert on that, but I do think this, that uh, the fossil fuel is not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and even the electric cars that are coming along, they do have a gas tank. Most of them, uh, the hybrid ones, uh, have a gas tank. But in my opinion, even let's say in 20 years or 30 years, if we all move to electric cars, they need to be charged at some place. Mm, yeah. And these gas stations can be converted into those uh, where they would provide a five minute charge, full charge for those cars. And you get paid for it as well. But also remember, if the cars go away, they don't need fuel anymore, they would need charge. But, but the kids still would need milk and whoever smokes will need a pack of cigarettes mm -hmm. and whoever drinks would need some beer or soda. So the gas stations will not go anywhere anytime soon awesome. because people love convenience. Yeah, very true. Awesome. That's great to hear. So um, I'm just curious, how do you work with your clients? Like what is the way that you, how do you coach them? What are the packages? That's well, I, you know, I don't have set packages. What I tell them is that I, at first I ask them, what is their need? What are they looking to get? Uh, and then uh, when I, when you asked about packages, I mean, I will say this, that there are some individual or family that, say, can you analyze 
this uh, two stores uh, financials and mm. see if one of them is uh, feasible for me to buy oh, okay. what i usually do is look at the data and analyze and then i realize that i need more so i just tell them hey you know i'll charge you x amount of dollar because i'm not making a trip i'm mm. just going to analyze it from my office so i charge a very nominal fee for that where but i tell them that get me this data and then we'll figure out if this is a good store or not and on the high end there are others that come in and say we're looking to do this and we're looking at three different packages and we'll send you all the data and then you decide what we need to which we need to buy and if you need to make trips you can and then based on where they are how many stores i'm looking at and how much uh, demographic research i have to do and all of that i come up with the pricing and i offer it to them and then we negotiate and if we agree then i take on that project where i travel to that location mm-hmm. uh, i stay for days and and do my research and gather up data and then i analyze all of that and then i give them a report that this is what i think you know this much money you will make out, out of buying this and this is the projected pnl and this is what it will cost to buy that's amazing like i really think you're like a gas station whisper <laughs> like it's <laughs> like their secret weapon so yeah i'm really fascinated by the you know the range of services that you provide because literally when you come in they know all the numbers they know the right decision to make so that is awesome that you but i will i just want to add one more thing to that mm-hmm. that there are families that just want to ask a simple question or say just look at this data see if it's a good one you know i don't charge for that i mean you know uh, so people are uh, free i mean should feel free to contact me and say just tell me if this is a good one and if if mm-hmm. i look at some numbers for 5 minutes you know there is no charge for that wow generous too i love that so <laughs> um so as, as somebody who you know has run this for so long what do you think is like the most fun part of being a gas station owner versus the most annoying parts about being a gas station owner well annoying part there are many <laughs> uh, 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 you know uh customers uh can be uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's just leave it at that customers <laughs> uh, i don't know if we should get into that but uh yeah, you know yeah, especially yeah. at at uh, on friday night or saturday night if uh, to give you an example if somebody is drunk and and they come in and wants to buy more beer mm-hmm. uh, legally we're not allowed to sell them beer because they appear to be intoxicated oh, okay, okay. and that's when the fun starts you refuse to sell them and they will buy it so <laughs> that's when you have to throw them out of the store or you know have to call the law and have them removed from the premises so that's not the fun part and the fun part is always making money right yes yes that's true That's awesome to hear like cuz I've read some crazy stories about um these uh gas station owners and the customers and you know sometimes they have to put like bulletproof glass or something and yeah, I think <laughs> on the area yeah. but you know if you ran or worked or associated with a gas station for let's say 10 15 years I'm sure you'll have enough material to write a book <laughs> uh, which can be funny and scary at the same time Yeah, that's such a great idea. I think um then you have to write it then. I <laughs> got to and I <laughs> but then I realized there are so many stories that are not so PG and you know oh, okay. get into the R rating and I didn't want to get into that. Okay. Well, maybe better for <laughs> book sales. But that's amazing. So great. So uh just one last question before we um end What advice would you give to immigrant CEOs, um not just people who want to own gas stations, but people who want to start on the entrepreneurial journey who are in America, uh what advice would you give them? I would say uh don't focus just on gas station. There are plenty of businesses out there that makes money. There are some that you can do from home, you know, uh and if you ask me which one, I don't exactly know, but I know there are online marketing there are uh, affiliate sales and and like you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that uh, there are businesses like laundry mat you know so there are plenty of business ideas that are out there so you just need to read uh, first come up with one or two and say hmm i may be interested in laundry mat or gas station start reading about those and see which one interests you the most and once you focus on that then you can contact somebody a broker or somebody and say show me what you have or another starting point would be call a broker or go on to the sites like uh, bizbuysell.com and see 
what businesses are out there for sales in your area and which one interests you the most. So that would be a good starting point. That is really selfless advice because um, you could have pitched your thing, but I'm, I'm glad no, that not everybody <laughs> is. That's true. Yeah, not everyone should. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I'm glad to could hear that. So if we're interested, you know, working more with you, continuing the conversation, or finding you online, what would be the best way to 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 do that? I think uh, the great starting point would be my uh, website, which is uh, gasstationbusiness101.com. Or if they need to email me, uh, uh, I'm not much on Facebook, but there is a Facebook group that I have. Uh, but I usually tell them to go on my site and, and they can email me directly from the site or they can uh, email me at shabir at gasstationbusiness101.com. So uh, usually I'm not much into social media. Uh, don't know why, never got into it. And uh, I think I need to, there's a learning curve and I haven't really uh, learned that. So I need to, that is one thing I need to do next year, which is learn social media and get involved. Wow. You're so humble because you're somebody who actually runs a podcast, you know, has a Facebook page and group and you say you want to learn more. So that's great. No, I really don't know much <laughs> about, <laughs> I really don't know much about social media, but I will need to learn that. That's awesome. And then you have a school. Um, can you tell us more about um, the school that you have? It's not really a school. I, I call coaching. it a, uh, yeah, it's a coaching, but what it is, is really, you know, anybody uh, that wants to learn about gas station business, that's why I uh, put so much uh, content into my website where they can learn every step of how to uh, find a station, how to buy one, how to manage one, how to run one, how to uh, you know, th there are modules that they're there uh, and, and they can just learn from the website. They don't even have to contact me. So I call it kind of like a uh, coaching uh, session type thing where it's mm -hmm. already on the site. Okay. They can just read about it. And then if they have any question, they can just email me. Awesome. Great. So this has been such a great learning opportunity for me. Um, thank you so much for giving us so much wisdom that literally nobody else could have known unless they, you know, where it was in the business uh, for as long as you have. So thank you so much for being on this show and hope to have you on future episodes to come. Thank you for having me. It was an honor.